Hey guys, how are you going? Hope you've had a really good week so far. Um, so we're going to do a public talk tonight. Uh, this is one of my ones that I do. It's uh, it's good for everyone, but the kids um, really like seem to like this one. Uh, so we're going to talk about how big space is, and and we'll go through some of the different objects that we can see in the night sky, and and how you know how far away it is, and also to put a little bit of funny. Thing into it, um, I've gone through and found out how long it would take Daniel Ricciardo to drive there in a Formula One car. So, if you uh, if you haven't seen, we've got a chat down the bottom here. It's Discord. Uh, so in the description, there's a link to it. If you haven't joined, you can ask questions, and I'll ask them. Uh, or I'll you can ask them, and I'll answer them at the end of this uh, end of the talk. And uh, yeah, there's also uh, our links to the our social media, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, which you can follow us on and get up to date news about astronomy and what's happening here at the Perth Observatory. There's our Patreon account as well. If you want to donate and get some cool stuff from the observatory and help uh, get uh, let us uh, do this kind of stuff with our live streaming, and uh, also if you can like, share, and and also uh, subscribe to our page, we'll be doing more of these. And even when we're allowed to go back and start doing our night sky tours where you get to come up and have a look through the telescopes. Uh, we'll still be trying to do these at least once a month at, uh, with either a public talk or a, a live stream through one of the telescopes. So, let's begin. So, space is really, really big. And uh, that's, that's you know, obviously one of the lines from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And uh, so how big is the universe? Well. The universe in diameter is 92 billion light years, as, as uh, Carl Sagan said, billions, so 92 billion years, uh, light years across in diameter. But that doesn't mean that the, uh, the universe is actually 92 billion years old. The universe is 13.8 uh, billion years old. and. The reason for the discrepancy is is that you know there's the universe has actually expanded in the meantime, uh, and so and it's there's a period of inflation where it really expanded as well, but from us we can only see the universe in any one direction for 46 billion light years, and uh, when you talk to astronomers and physicists you can actually you know you, they talk about how their stuff that's on the edge of that where it's actually passing through our observable uh, sphere of what we can see. There is a universe out, outside of that observable universe, it's just that the light has taken so long to get to us from, uh, that we can only see a certain amount as so far. We can only see a sphere of that 92 billion uh, light years in diameter. So, there's some di uh, distance measurements that we use to measure stuff in, uh, in the solar system and also once we get out of there as well, out into the deep space. So, we have an a 1 AU and that's the distance from Earth to the Sun, which is just under 150 million ki uh, kilometers. Uh, so, it's, you know, decent, you know, only a couple, about 400,000 uh, light years before. You know, for 150 million. We have one, uh, one light year which is ne uh, nearly 9.5 trillion kilometers. So you really understand how, sp uh, how big space is. Uh, if the Sun was the size of a uh, golf ball, the nearest star would be somewhere around about X mouth or uh, which is uh, which is almost halfway up uh, Western Australia for, for our international guests. So when you have a look at a map of Australia, Western Australia is on the west coast of course. It's uh, the largest state in Australia uh, and it's bigger than uh, most, of, uh, most of Europe as well. So it's quite a, quite a distance. A parsec is what we use and I'll talk about that in the next slide about uh, what a parsec is. But that's 3.26 light years. And uh, so when, um, when uh, it's so Han Solo made the Kessel Run he did, uh, in less than 12 parsecs, while he was meaning it in a, t uh, in a time measurement, it's actually a distance measurement. So 
While he could, while he was wrong, he was technically right. He made the Kessel Run in less than 39 light years. But to add a little, uh, I, I love Formula One. Um, apart from AFL, or crickets, American football, all, all these sports, and basketball as well. Um, Formula One is really, I, I love it. And uh, Daniel Ricciardo is my favourite driver, uh, and a Perth boy, of course. And so I was sitting around going, uh, you know, well, I needed a new, another presentation, and I thought this was a great way to at least so you can see how big the universe is. I worked out how long it would take him in his Formula One car if you just pointed in a direction and went to that, uh, went to that uh, object. No using slingshot methods or anything like that, but just going straight ahead. And in a year, I worked out that he would travel. Uh, 2,806,704 uh, kilometers. And so we'll call that a Ricardo year for later on in this talk. But how do we find the distances to stars and, and objects? Well, we have, uh, when, when it comes to uh, cl uh, close objects, relatively close objects to us in the, uh, in the galaxy, in the universe, or in our galaxy, we can use what's called the parallax method, and you can see in the uh, in the uh, in this uh, it's, uh, the uh, diagram here. What we do is we take an image of the star in December, and then in six months we wait and we take another image in June, and then we use Pythagoras theorem to work out the distance and that point here. Is is what we call is the uh, is the parsect. So a star that's um, that's three point two six light years is one parsect. There's a point where we can't go. Uh, it's just too hard to um, to measure. So because the star is so far or the galaxy is so far away from us. So what we use there is the standard candle method, and this is a special type of. Uh, of supernova. It's, it's because of a, a white dwarf that is orbiting around a normal star and it's leeching off or sucking off material, uh, parasite as, as you would say. And we use this method uh, uh, once the parallax angle gets less than 0 .1, uh, 0.01 arc seconds uh, be, just because it's way too difficult with our atmosphere. And so with this white dwarf, it's sucking off material, but there's a point called the Chandrasekhar limit, which is 1.44 solar masses. So that's a solar mass is, the one solar mass is the weight of our sun. So this, this white dwarf can keep on sucking in material and stay a white dwarf until it gets to about 1.44 times the mass of our sun. And, that, and when it gets to that point, it just collapses on itself, it can't hold itself in, and it just blows up. But because it's always going to blow up at that limit, we can then, and also supernovas uh, outshine their own galaxy for a good couple of weeks to a couple of months, we can actually see these supernovas in other galaxies. And then we, and because the explosion is always the same, the same brightness, uh, so, uh, we can then measure using it as if it was a candle and we can just see it go, uh, and we can work out, okay, it is a type one supernova, a type one a supernova. And then we can go, all right, so let's measure the brightness. And then, well, that brightness was, this, uh, this galaxy supernova was brighter than this one. And so this means that galaxy is closer than that galaxy. And we can actually see this uh, in a video that Castra, which was a uh, Australian um, organization, uh, did here. And so we've got two stars rotating around each other. One will event, uh, you can start to see that the orange star here is going into its red giant phase. So it's coming towards the end of its life. The other star here starts sucking off the material and so that star is actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But you can notice that there's all this gassiness coming off the star. And this is going to form a planetary nebula. 
you can see the star is dying here and there's the white dwarf and it's just now orbiting around this around this uh, this the pair uh, this parent star and you can see that shell of material that if you've done, uh, had watched a couple of the last live streams that we've done uh, we've shown a pl uh, planetary nebula and that's exactly what's the case now we have the white dwarf orbiting around the star and be you can actually see now here that the white dwarf is much more dense so it has a lot more gravity in its warp space a lot more so that it can that gravity can start to steal material off off the the, uh, the parent star which will now start to occur and you can see there's a little uh, chart here down the bottom as as the star, uh, white dwarf is gaining more mass it's coming up to that Chandra Sekar limit and here it goes it's about to blow up bang and there it is that's what's left over and uh, so I believe this might have been Tycho's uh, Tycho's supernova which was um, discovered uh, Tycho Bray is a Danish astronomer look him up he's really interesting history he's actually had a um, he's the man with the iron nose because he liked dueling and uh, with swords of course not pistols at the time but it got his nose cut off and uh, but a very interesting story he was the um, uh, the mentor to Johann Kepler who worked out that the planet's orbits aren't perfectly circular but elliptical but uh, that was I believe that's his uh, supernova remnant that he, he saw he saw a supernova so some of the uh, so we'll go into our first uh, object that we can see in the night sky so we've got the International Space Station so it orbits about 408 kilometers above the earth it gets uh, every so often when they get a cargo uh, ship up there they can boost it a little bit higher but it fluctuates but on average is about 408 kilometers above the earth it's moving at nearly eight kilometers a second so to go from the observatory to the CBD of Perth we're about 40 minutes by uh, by car you would get to the uh, get to the C, uh, CBD at that speed in a couple of couple of seconds and it's it's actually about uh, oh, just over an oval size as well uh, so or, uh, pitch and uh, but Daniel Ricardo would get there in one hour and six minutes 16 minutes we've got the moon and uh, and and guys if you want to uh, if you want to put some of your guesses as I'm talking well how long you think it uh, will be that that's another cool thing you can do we can see who's uh, who's usually on uh, the closest. We have the moon, our um, our, uh, our partner in uh, in this orbit around the sun, and uh, on average, it's about three hundred eighty-four thousand four hundred kilometers away from Earth. You can actually fit it within Australia. If you put it next to Australia, it will fit in between Perth and Sydney. And it's the fifth biggest moon in the solar system as well. The only other moons that are bigger are Ganymede, which orbits around uh, Saturn, or sorry, Jupiter, uh, Titan, which orbits around Saturn. Uh, both those two moons are actually bigger than, uh, than uh, Mercury, the uh, first planet in the solar system. And Ganymede is about 50 times, uh, is it, no, actually uh, Titan's about half, uh, double the size of the moon as well. We then have Callisto, which also orbits around Jupiter. It's kind of the punching bag of the solar system. It's heavily cratered. And then we have Io, which, or Eo, depending on how you like to say it. And Eo is the most geologically active body in the solar system. The, uh, the poor moon gets squeezed by not only Jupiter, but by Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and, uh, but much more Europa and Ganymede and uh, that causes the moon's core to be very hot and uh, and also there's a lot of volcanoes on it and it orbits around the sun every 28 days as well so and it's it orbits on its axis every 28 days as well so it's tightly locked we always see the same face and uh, it was created by a collision uh, from earth and the planet uh, planetoid called Thea which we believe uh, collided at first we thought maybe it was a glancing shot but now with more simulations it works out that it actually was a head-on collision and this was at the beginning of the solar system and uh, and 
uh, it would have been a the would have been about the size of Mars, and we worked out this theory because when we finally got some of the moon rocks back, uh, particularly the Genesis rock, which is a Norther site from Apollo 15, we worked out uh, that was a piece of the original crust of the moon, and we worked out that while it did have it was very similar to the Earth's uh, crust, there were differences. So it didn't uh, it discounted that the Earth flung off. The moon as it was rotating so quickly that was one theory because we slow down every uh, as the moon is moving away so what happens if it's moved closer the earth spins up or maybe it flung off it also discounted the theory that it was a captured body or that it all uh, it formed right next to it at the same time and so some of the it's it's uh, it's very poor in some of the heavy elements and that's because when the collision occurred, they formed a ring around the Earth and some of those heavier elements like cobalt and uh, uranium and that fell back to Earth quite qu uh, quickly. And what was left over, uh, the moon formed out of in about, in about 100 million years or so. But Daniel Ricciardo would reach the moon in about 50 days. And so, you know, there's a... You know, you'd have to definitely pack your lunch and a, you know, a decent amount of lunches. Um, the astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, got there in about three days. Uh, New Horizons got there in about uh, in got to the moon's orbit uh, in about nine hours on its way to uh, Pluto as well. So the next object we've got is Mars. And uh, second half of this year, Mars is go uh, going to be at its closest point to the Earth, so um, it will be on our night sky tours, and uh, it will actually be worth looking at. After that, give it a couple, uh, say six months, it won't be worth looking at, because it will just look like a red, red dot. Uh, when it's at its closest point, we actually can see ice, uh, the ice caps, we can see real definition, and then it's worth looking at. But every two years is Mars season. So Mars is about 500, uh, nearly 55 million, uh, million kilometers away from the Earth. And it's about half the size of the Earth. Uh, it orbits every one, uh, the Sun every 1.9 years, or close to two years. Uh, and it's got the largest volcano and the largest valley. So uh, the largest volcano is uh, Valles Marinaris. It's about the size of France. And uh, it's so big that you really, really wouldn't notice. Uh, you wouldn't have to put a lot of effort climbing up it. It's it's just a it's just a, a, a steady walk. And uh, the Valles Marinaris is a massive big gash, which they there's still some theories about what it is, but uh, they think what's happened is there's been some period of uh, of volcanism, particularly around that. Uh, Olympus Mons area which caused the crust to actually crack and this is where Valles Marinaris came from but it's the size of the US it's all boom, basically the size of the Australia as well it is a massive big gash only you know when you talk about you know, having the Grand Canyon or something like that it's just a small little sliver off that would be what the Grand Canyon would, would be but Daniel Ricardo would take how to help you know you think maybe you know we had 50 days for the uh, for the uh, for the moon? We're thinking probably you know 10 years maybe. Actually, it's 20 years. So uh, yeah, you know, you've really got to really get, uh, <laughs> you've really got to want to be going to Mars in a Formula One car to spend all those years. Uh, we've got Jupiter here now. This is where it's best. It's about over a billion kilometers away from us, so it's better just to easier to use AUs. So it's nearly four AUs away from from Earth. Uh, it's the biggest planet in the solar system, and you could fit all the planets in it and still have leftovers. It would accommodate thirteen hundred Earths. That's it's just an enormous uh, planet, and it's scary to think that we found much bigger. Uh, planets around orbiting around other stars as well. So it's a behemoth that's uh, nearly 140 kil uh, thousand kilometers across in diameter. That red spot is a tornado that's uh, that's about uh, t almost two Earths uh, wide as well. And 
Uh, it orbits around the sun every 12, nearly 12 years as well. So Daniel Ricardo would get to uh, Jupiter in, you know, so thinking maybe we had 20 years, you know, maybe 50, 70, maybe 100 years. Actually, it's a little bit longer. 210 years he would it would take to get to uh, to Jupiter. And so we're going to start with we're going to continue on our journey. So we're you know we're coming towards the end of the solar system, and uh, we reach Pluto. And Pluto, that lovable dwarf planet, it still still breaks my heart that it's not considered a a planet anymore. But it's amazing what New Horizons was able to. To see, and uh, it's it is an amazing world, uh, and hopefully we'll eventually get an orbiter there so that we can learn so much more. It's got that lovely heart-shaped glacier as well, and uh, so it's a decent uh, decent uh, distance away from Earth. It's not something that would really be able to show you on a night sky tour, just because it's so small. Uh, <laughs> and yes, it would be a lot of petrol. <laughs> Um, and uh, so it's 30, nearly 40 AUs away from Earth. It's, uh, you can actually fit it within Western Australia, even if you might need a little bit of help from the Northern Territory and South Australia, which is to the east of Western Australia. And it does have po uh, possible ice volcanoes as well. Well, it would date Daniel Ricardo, 1,581 years in his Formula One car to get to to uh, Pluto, so don't hold your breath. <laughs> so now we've le we've left the solar system and uh, we're going to go to our nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Now, Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf star that orbits Alpha Centauri A and B, and uh, so it's it's not visible uh, in a normal telescope. Uh, you'll just see Alpha Centauri A and B. They orbit around each other every 80 years, where uh, Proxima orb uh, orbits Alpha Centauri A and B every five, 550,000 uh, years. And um, it's 4.2 light years away from us. And, you know, unfortunately, that is, uh, for our current technology, that is a, a distance, uh, that's quite a distance. And we'll probably... Uh, we won't be able to get there, well, famous last words, we probably won't be able to get there for a number of generations at least. And uh, so this is a star that's, the red dwarfs are the most popular star in the solar system. And they they litter the area, they, they are very economical, the, uh, there hasn't been enough time in the universe for the very first ones to die. They think maybe a hundred billion, you know, billion years um, uh, will uh, take for the very uh, their lifespans. Our sun is about 10 billion uh, years uh, in lifespan, but it's a middle of the road star, and so uh, you know its its you know its diameter is about nearly 215 uh, th uh, thousand kilometers in diameter. So. <laughs> So uh, it is quite small, if, especially if you put it next to uh, to the sun. It, it would look, you know, just be, uh, bigger than Jupiter. Daniel Ricardo would take nearly nearly fifteen uh, f nearly fifteen million years to get there, and uh, so yeah, you know, you you're really hoping for no pe a, a few petrol stations on the way if, if you needed it to. We've got Sirius, the brightest star in the solar system. Uh, oh, sorry, the brightest star in our, uh, in both hemispheres. And it's 8.6 light years away from us. It is bigger than our sun at uh, 2 million kilometers across. And it's located in the constellation Canis Majoris. So if you go out uh, outside your house and look uh, after this talk and look west, you'll see a very bright star and that is Sirius. It's actually a double star and if you've got a really really big telescope and you've got a really high powered eyepiece you can actually you'll be able to split the two uh, and uh, so yeah that is something once you've got your once you've made your millions and uh, you're allowed to buy all sorts of cool stuff and you buy a massive big telescope and really cool gear then uh, you can go out and try and split the two stars. 
But Daniel Ricardo would take nearly 29 million years. So it's it's getting, you know, he started to think you're really stupid numbers here, stupendous numbers. The next object we've got is the Orion Nebula. So located in the Orion const, uh, constellation. Um, the funny thing is, is that uh, someone, we do, we do a Star Trek night you know, for first contact on April 5th. And uh, we found a uh, documentary, uh, so actually a presentation that some, uh, scientists had done working out how big the, the, the Federation was. And it worked out to be 400 light years away. And we, you're supposed to have the Orion Syndicate, which is the uh, a criminal gang from the uh, Orion area, uh, within the actual Federation. Well... You know, the Orion Nebula and the constella uh, and the constellations are at different, um, obviously at different uh, distances from Earth. But the Orion Nebula itself is thirteen hundred and forty-four light years away, of thirteen hundred, uh, one thousand three hundred forty-four uh, thousand light years away from us, and it's twenty-five light years in diameter. So, it's not in the uh, not in the Federation. But it's a reflective and an emissions nebula. So there are stars uh, in that we can see that their light is bouncing off the dust and then being reflected back to Earth. And so that's lighting up. But some of that radiation coming off the star, uh, those stars, are uh, heating up the gas and dust and causing it to glow like a uh, fluorescent tube or so. And so it's, both, it's two types of nebula. It's a star forming region, so we can actually see st uh, baby stars being formed, uh, little globules or s stars with planetary disks where planets could be forming or p uh, sibling stars. It's actually f most, it's fairly common to have stars with siblings, so, you know, so in binary or triple or quadruple star systems. So, you know, how long would it take Daniel Ricardo in a Formula One car to go 1,344 light years? It would take four, nearly four, or just over 4.5 billion light, year, uh, light years to go, uh, well, years to, oh, sorry, years to go. So you, know, it, you, you really, really want to, you really want to be going and have no other method. <laughs> we have the jewel box, which is a lovely cluster which we showed a couple of weeks back in our live stream of the night sky. Uh, that uh, it's uh, got about 80, 100 stars. Uh, it's located very close to the Southern Cross. It's uh, you can actually see it in your binoculars as well, but it's always good to have a look at it through a telescope. It's 14 light years across in diameter, and it's uh, just under 6, 000, uh, 6, and, and, uh, 6 and uh light years away from us. Uh, they're 14 million years old, so think of them as, you know, toddlers for stars. They're very, very young, and they've still got their lives ahead of them. Daniel Ricardo would take. Let's see, we've got hun, we've got hundreds, million, uh, thousands, millions, and we're still in the billions. We're 21.6 billion billion light, uh, light years, as again Carl Sagan would say. We have Omega Centauri, which we showed uh, again in our li uh, live streams. This is nearly 16,000 light years away from Earth. 170 light years in diameter, making it the biggest globular cluster or the old folks home that's orbiting around in the uh, halo of our, uh, of our galaxy. Right, there's around about 10 million stars. They're about 12 billion years old, so you know it's it's very, very bright in the in the middle. You wouldn't, if you're a planet in uh, which we still actually haven't found any planets in these globular clusters. Um, if there were ones in the centre, there just would be no nighttime because it would be so bright from having so many stars. Daniel Ricardo would get there in 53, uh, just over 53 billion years. So uh, yeah, we we're, we're really starting to rack up those years and. Probably not the most economical way to get it around the solar system with a Formula 1 car, is it? We've got the Tarantula Nebula. So this is the furthest object that we can show you on a night sky tour that's not 
um, that's not uh, in our actual, uh, not a galaxy. It's not even in our own galaxy. This is in the large Magellanic Cloud. It's a, it's 700 light years across. It's one of the biggest nebulas that we've uh, seen. It's like the Orion Nebula. It's both in a reflective and emissions nebula, uh, and it's a star forming region. This nebula is breeding stars like rabbits. And this is because it's on the edge of the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Large Magellanic Cloud is now starting to be disturbed by the gravity of our, of our Milky Way. The, the Milky Way has got its tentacles out and it's trying to draw it in and become its next, uh, the, uh, the event, uh, eventually the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud will be the uh, next victim of, uh, of our Milky Way galaxy. There's been about about ooh, 10 or 11 dwarf galaxies that we can see that have been sucked up by our galaxy so that it can continue on and get even bigger and bigger and bigger. Daniel Ricciardo would take oh, nearly 539 billion years to get uh, to, uh, to the uh, Tarantula Nebula. So yeah, it's it's quite a quite a distance. So we have the Andromeda Galaxy, our uh, cl closest ga uh, galaxy that's not a, ta a dwarf galaxy uh, to us, nearly uh, to 2.5 million light years away from us. We can see it in our night sky tours for about two weeks as it goes between the trees and gets covered by the our Lowell Dome. Uh, which uh, we uh, which holds our Lowell Perth Lowell telescope, um, and the Lowell part comes from Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, where they actually found Pluto. They gave us a telescope so we could be part of the International Planetary Patrol program, so we named a dome after them. And uh, it's twice the size of our of our galaxy. It's got more stars. Our our galaxy we think has about a hundred billion stars. The Andromeda Galaxy has 200 to, four, uh, sorry, 200 to 400 billion stars. And give it about 4 to 4.5 billion years, and there'll be a merger. But uh, really, it's going to be a hostile takeover because it's twice the size of us. Uh, so it's the biggest, uh, it's the biggest uh, galaxy in our local group of galaxies. We're second biggest. So hopefully, you know, we can just add some more weight on with some more dwarf galaxies before the co collision occurs. And Daniel Ricciardo would get there in just over 8.5 trillion uh, years. So, yep, yeah, we're, we're starting to get some really ridiculous... <laughs> well, we thought we were getting into ridiculous numbers. We're really getting into l uh, large numbers here, and it's only going to get worse. We have the Virgo supercluster, which is one of the closest superclusters of galaxies. And so this is 65 million light years away from us uh, in the constellation Virgo. So there are some really nice galaxies if you go out with a telescope. So, you know, on a dark sky night when we don't have a moon, uh, when you don't, uh, if you can get out to the country, once the uh, we can get out to the country, and uh, it's always good just to uh, get a camera and put it on and you know and take some photos if you can. We do some workshops if you, if you do want to get into astrophotography, so just keep an eye on uh, our social media and website as well. It's uh, it's 110 light years uh, in diameter, so just think about that. It's 65 million uh, light years away from us, but it's 110 kilometers in diameter. So it's actually uh, longer in diameter than it is further away from us. And it contains about 100 galaxies uh, in that group as well. So it is, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And you can see there are some nice galaxies colliding in there. Daniel Ricciardo would get in there. So let's have a look here. We have... Ooh, we have hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, and now we're into the hundreds of trillions. 219 trillion years it would take Daniel Ricciardo to get uh, get to the um, Virgo supercluster. Actually, I worked out uh, with the Andromeda galaxy that he uh, if uh, he would be le just leaving. 
the uh, the Milky Way galaxy as the galaxies were colliding and as he got to the point of where the Andromeda galaxy was when he left uh, he would have watched the galaxies merge they were seen the starburst uh, time where because there's all this gas and dust uh, coming together it caused a lot of star formation and then would actually watch the death of the uh, of the the galaxy as well so the next thing that we're going to measure and we're coming to the towards the end this is the uh, the furthest galaxy we've ever seen and it's got the lovely name of GN hash uh, dash 711 galaxy and uh, it's 32 billion light years away from the earth when the light left there uh, it's 4,000 uh, light years in diameter so it's you know this is a proto galaxy it's not these one of these nice lovely uh, spiral galaxies that we get to see it was created 4 million years after the Big Bang and uh, it would yeah, and so it's quite uh, quite an amazing thing that we can see that far back Daniel Ricardo would get there in his Formula One car so again, we've got hundreds, mil, uh, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, 107 quadrillion years, over, uh, nearly 108 uh, quadrillion years. So yeah, it's just the, we're really racking up these numbers, aren't we? We have the edge of the universe, of the observable universe as it is now. So that's, so we can, uh, so that's 46 billion years and if you've got any more questions if you guys got questions please put them in the discord um, and we can answer them beforehand uh, before we finish tonight and so Daniel Ricardo this is the last object guys we've finally made it all the way Daniel Ricardo to drive all that way would take him 155 quadrillion years uh, and so yeah so so what have we learnt? Uh, so you know, what have we learned is is that space is big, and I mean it's really, really big, and possibly that uh, a Formula One car which needs a road has fine out finite amount of fuel, needs air for downforce, cooling, and also so the passenger can eat. The uh, has an infinite uh, driver who has an infinite li uh, finite lifespan and needs food, toilet break as well. Needs a decent amount of stuff to keep him occupied, like music and you know TV shows on long, that long journey. Probably isn't the best method uh, of transport in space. So hopefully we'll uh, be able to develop warp speed or so, or we um, you know within the next couple of hundred years, so that we can go out and see all this cool stuff and uh, expand our knowledge of the solar system. So. That comes towards that comes to the end of the presentation, guys. I uh, hope you really enjoyed it, and thanks for sticking around for all this time. If you um, please, if you can uh, sh like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and uh, press the no uh, bell notification so you know when we do this. Um, we'll be doing a live stream of the uh, of the night sky and uh, looking at the forecast after four nights of cl uh, four sat days of cloud. We finally got a clear day, so fingers crossed it still, and knock on wood as well, that it still stays clear for Saturday night. Um, and also, you know, join the Discord channel if you want. We, um, we'll, you, you can ask questions even uh, uh, during the live streams as well through the telescope. You can do that during the, uh, in the description. And also follow us on social media and we'll keep you up to date with what's happening at the observatory and also what's happening in space and astronomy because even though we're trapped in our houses and uh, and of, of me at the observatory um, the world is still the universe is still going ticking along quite nicely so thanks very much guys and uh, we hope you had a really good time and uh, we'll see you next time